Hello everybody, this is uh, your teacher, Aaron Owens. Let's go ahead and take a look at Chapter 3 of the American Pageant, 16th edition. It's called Settling the Northern Colonies. I put in parentheses there, and the Middle Colonies, because both uh, sets of colonies will be discussed during Chapter 3. As always, I've put your MLA, APA, and Chicago-style citations uh, on this presentation for you to use if you ever need it for the American Pageant, 16th edition. Now, what essential questions are we going to answer in Chapter 3? Well, they're going to be similar to the essential questions in Chapter 2, just a different region of the colonies. So, we need to be able to understand what the motives were for settlement in the northern or the New England and Middle Colonies. We need to understand how these colonies are different from the southern colonies. We need to see the relationship between the colonies and England and be able to describe what that relationship was like. We also need to see how the Middle and New England colonies relate with the Native Americans, and we need to see how important religion is in these colonies. As we get through this, you're going to understand the, the similarities and the differences between the three colonial zones. And finally, where do we see early seeds of democracy? That's a very crucial question, and we'll be pointing those out as we go through the presentation. Here you see a map of uh, the colonial zones. Of course, this is going to focus on the Middle and New England colonies. They're in green and purple. Now, the primary motivation for the Northern and the Middle colonies was religious freedom and separation. That is starkly different than the Southern colonies. The Southern colonies uh, primarily wanted to come over for economic ventures, but this is a different story. Most of the religious dissidents that came to the Americas were various sects of European Calvinists, and we learned a lot about that in world history and AP Euro. The biggest group that, that we note here are the Puritans. They do want to thrive economically, and they do, because they have a good hard work ethic. Um, so it's not just that they want religious freedom, that's their major motivation, but they also want to thrive economically as does all colonial groups. The Puritans wanted to purify the Church of England. They thought that they should live saintly lives with others of their own faith and keep away from the corruption of the unsaved. Now, King Henry VIII aided the entrance of the Protestant religion to England when he broke from the Catholic Church. We know about that from AP Euro. The Pilgrims left. They said, this is not for us. Most people think they came directly to the New World, and that's not the case. They actually set out and lived in the Netherlands for a while, in Holland. But they were concerned that their children were becoming too Dutch. So they decided to get permission from the Virginia Company to come over and work in Jamestown. Here on the right you see a, a typical artist rendition of Pilgrim's Landing in the New World with the the hats and the musket guns. It's exactly what you think about when you think about pilgrims. Now, the pilgrims came over, of course, on the Mayflower, and we learned uh, that when we were in elementary school. They were blown off course heading towards Jamestown and landed way up north in New England. Before they decided upon a settlement, they took uh, several different surveys, and they did finally settle on Plymouth Bay. They didn't just wash up on Plymouth Rock and step out and be like, oh, well, this is where we're going to be. Uh, they took several surveys and, and decided upon that particular region. The settlement was, of course, outside of the domain of the Virginia Company, so they actually had no permission to settle there or form a government. They were essentially squatters, but as we know historically, things worked out. The area would become what we know as uh, Plymouth Bay Colony, and that is later going to be absorbed by the Massachusetts Bay Colony, much larger colonial group, in 1692. You see over here on the right the, the landing site of the Pilgrims, uh, uh, Plymouth Bay area. Here's a map uh, that, de that depicts uh, the region a little bit better. You can find on the map the first landing of the Mayflower there, the, the Horn, and then on into Plymouth, Plymouth Bay. 
Another early seed of American democracy is the Mayflower Compact. Now, some historians or some people believe that this is more than it really is. This is pretty much just a crude agreement uh, that the settlers agreed upon while they were on the boat. This isn't a constitution, but it's still very historically significant. Uh, it's a step towards self-government, and that is a crucial seed of democracy. It signed on November 11th of 1620. It did set a precedent, as I said, for local rule by colonists in the future. So this document is historically significant. It lays the path for democracy in America down the road. Of course, you see on the right there, rendition of the signing of the Mayfire Compact in 1620. Now, the Pilgrims saw themselves as conducting, uh, as I call it here, a holy experiment. They want to live completely separate from non-believers, and they're going to impose religious strictness upon themselves. They did find uh, some economic success in fur, fishing, lumber, uh, those economic ventures. And a lot of people are misconstrued about the initial relationship with the natives. Okay? In actuality, the initial relationship with the natives was quite positive. Of course, that is going to change in the coming years and I am not an America homer we definitely did the natives wrong but the initial onset of between the pilgrims and the natives was fairly positive uh, we've learned about Thanksgiving when we were little and we've probably got a new idea of Thanksgiving uh, as we've gotten older and the truth lies somewhere between this is the worst thing that ever happened and the Thanksgiving that we learned about when we were in kindergarten. There's a good video in my playlist uh, on period two. It's called What's the Truth About the First Thanksgiving? Um, it's definitely something you ought to check out. I, I, I find it to be probably the best historical uh, rendition of the first Thanksgiving in about five minutes. They had a much easier time uh, than the people in Jamestown. The casualties were much lower. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is they had an extremely strong leader like William Bradford. Now you see Bradford depicted over on the right in typical pilgrim type clothing. He's actually elected governor 30 times. Um, he's very historically significant and someone you should definitely make note. Later on, Massachusetts Bay Company is going to enter the mix. They secure their charter in 1629. They were non-separatists and were still connected to the Church of England. And that kind of separates them initially from the pilgrims. They're not near as hard-nosed religiously as the pilgrims uh, to the north in the Plymouth Colony and to the east. Uh, but many Puritans are going to settle here in years to come. And as I mentioned earlier... Plymouth is going to get absorbed by Massachusetts Bay later on down the road. Um, of course, the main center of Massachusetts Bay was Boston. Um, started off in 1630 with about a hundred or about a thousand settlers. It's a much larger scale uh, colony uh, than the others at that time. They were well equipped. They were well funded. Uh, they had a, a diverse range of skills and education level in that colony. And they all had a shared purpose for being there. So Massachusetts Bay is going to be quite successful uh, from the get-go. In the decades to come, you're going to see a large migration of people coming to Massachusetts Bay. During the Great Migration of England in the 1630s, about 20,000 uh, new settlers are going to go to Massachusetts Bay. The rest of those are primarily going to go to the West Indies. They do very well financially later on in fishing and shipbuilding. They're not separatists, as I mentioned earlier, but they do come with pretty deep religious backgrounds, um, and that becomes crucial. The Puritan doctrine includes acceptance in the idea with a covenant with God. John Winthrop is their able leader and serves governor uh, for 19 different terms. Now, Winthrop gives an extremely famous speech called The City Upon a Hill. And this is a primary source document that you must take note of. It's very AP worthy. It's been on the AP ex exam several different years and could very easily be on this year's AP exam. 
And the city upon the hill speech is Winthrop saying that he wants Massachusetts Bay to kind of be the shining light or the beacon for the world about how they were treated by God based on how well they behaved. Some interesting notes about Massachusetts Bay include that all adult male members of the Puritan congregation could vote. This is about 40% of adult males. Now, is it perfect democracy? No, but it's way more voters than back in England or anywhere else uh, in North America. All male property owners could vote and publicly speak out in town government. And the purpose of government to them was to support God's law and enforce religious rules. It's not a democracy, but we can see the seeds of democracy here. Okay, So that's crucial to note. Uh, one thing I mentioned earlier was this Protestant work ethic. And the Puritans in New England believed in hard work, and they were very committed to their work and worldly pursuits. Here you see a map of uh, the original boundary line between Massachusetts Bay uh, and the Plymouth Colony. We also see some of our first American misfits come out of uh, this particular region. The first one is Anne Hutchison. Uh, Anne is a very interesting historical figure. Uh, she's banned from the colony for not following the typical religious rules. Okay, It was a, a corrupt thing for the people in Massachusetts Bay uh, for her to be spouting her views. And she believed that she need not bother to obey the laws of God or man. She felt as though that anybody could read the Bible and there was no reason to listen to a preacher. Okay? That is historically significant. And Anne is extremely historically significant. She's going to be banished from Massachusetts Bay, as I said, and she's going to flee to Rhode Island. Okay? And Rhode Island, in and of itself, is a very interesting colony, to say the least. She ultimately has 14 children, and she is killed by Indians in upstate New York in 1638. See Anne over here on the right uh, in front of the Puritan town folk. Another one of our famous misfits is Roger Williams. Now, Williams is banned for speaking out against the church and the government of Massachusetts Bay. Um, he's an extreme separatist who thought the government was very corrupt. Um, so he tries to get out and is successful, and he establishes Rhode Island okay, in 1636. And he also establishes the First Baptist Church in the United States, or the uh, colonies that would become the United States. Um, he enacted complete religious freedom and tolerance for all in Rhode Island. This is um, very significant historically in our nation's founding. It's originally a squatter's colony because they have no permission or charter to be there. However, they do kind of purchase the land from the local Indian tribe, the Nargisets, and in 1636. They do secure a charter in 1644 from English Parliament, and they are nicknamed the Rogue Island. Rhode Island becomes known as a colony for individualists and independent attitudes. Here's a map showing uh, the border between Rhode Island and the rest of the colonies. Uh, Rhode Island's the smallest of the colonies, and today it's the smallest state. It's bordered by some important colonies. You have Connecticut, Massachusetts Bay, and Plymouth. Now, Connecticut is founded by two fellows, Thomas Hooker and John Haynes. Hooker is a preacher, and Haynes is a, a former governor uh, from over in Massachusetts Bay. And they draft what is called the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut in 1639, which is basically our first constitution-style document in the New World. It's, it's much more expansive than, say, the Mayflower Compact. So uh, Connecticut... Uh, you see a major seed of early American democracy there as well. As we go along, we're going to see the natives' uh, uh, relationship change with the English settlers. It says 75% of the Native American population in New England area had already died by the time the Puritans got there in 1620s. That is probably due to uh, exposure from sh uh, fishing expeditions in the region. 
Uh, so the local natives were really in no position to fight off Europeans. So they reluctantly, probably reluctantly, just kind of had to have peace there at the beginning. Um, so I, I, I kind of phrased it here as they had initial peace by default. Unlike other English voyages to the New World, the Puritans uh, were here to stay. And they were here to build a long-standing colony. They were here for life. As the New Englanders spread out uh, from the coast, more confrontations are going to become free. Now, as conflict arises between the uh, settlers and the natives, uh, we're going to see a different relationship. The first that the American pageant really talks about is King Philip's War, a series of clashes between a fellow by the name of Metacom, uh, named King Philip by the English, and the New England settlers in 1675 and 76. Now, don't let that get confused. He is, an, he is a Native American. The Indians attacked 52 towns and destroyed 12 of those towns, and hundreds of colonists and thousands of Indians died in this uh, conflict. Metacom was drawn and quartered and beheaded, and his head hung on a pike uh, in Plymouth for many years to come. His wife and son were sold into slavery. It was a lasting defeat of New England Native Americans, and resistance was extremely sparse after King Philip's War. It's almost, uh, and I, I say it like this because I don't know how to say it, but it's like the natives learned their lesson, that they could not beat uh, the English in armed conflict. Some interesting uh, unifying corporations uh, occur during this time period as well, and the first of that we see is the New England Confederacy. It's formed in 1643 by four colonies uh, as England was wrapped up in civil wars over there. They get together and form this confederacy for their own personal defense. Now the four colonies... Uh, that make up this confederacy are Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth, along with Connecticut and New Haven. Okay, those, so those are the four colonies. And as I said, it's primarily used for defense. They also dealt with problems like runaway slaves. Each colony had two votes despite its size. Massachusetts Bay doesn't like this. Now this is historically significant as we step into the Constitution later on, uh, when we talk about the Great Compromise. It's a very interesting attempt at, at colonial unity because it's the colonists who are doing it. It has nothing to do with the English government or parliament. Okay, This is the colonies banding together by themselves. Now, there is uh, a corporation formed by the royal authority, and that's called the Dominion of New England. It's different in the New England Confederation because this is Parliament doing it, and pretty much it's all of New England, New York, and Jersey that is under this Dominion of England. Now, they created, it was created to make sure that the Navigation Acts go smoothly and everything, all the taxes are collected uh, for that. Um, you're reading about that situation in your chapter. Now, these are to control colonial trade. And the settlers in New England are not a huge fan of this, obviously. So smuggling becomes a very common and actually honorable profession. The colonists were used, uh, were uh, accustomed to the years of what's called salutary neglect. And salutary neglect is where England pretty much lets the colonies do whatever they want. And the colonies had grown accustomed to that. That, doc, that term's going to become very crucial later on. So it should come as no surprise that the colonies despise the navigation laws and they despise the administrator, Sir Edmund Andros. Once again, I have to impress upon you the importance of salutary neglect. It's going to keep coming up. We are going to describe that as one of the major causes of the American Revolution. The Dominion of New England collapses during the Glorious Revolution. Sir Edmund Andros is shipped back to England, and salutary neglect uh, starts again, which is a good thing. 
for the colonies. They prefer salutary neglect. Now let's have a general look at the middle colonies. You're talking New York, New Jersey, Delaware, and Pennsylvania. Uh, the soil in this particular region is pretty fertile, uh, and the size of the colonies were very large in, in respect to the other colonies. So we kind of call these the breadbasket colonies. Uh, they're blessed by large rivers, uh, and this helps with fur trading and with agriculture. They have several large seaports, uh, including New York City, uh, Philadelphia, and Albany. They're located midway between the southern uh, colonies and the New England colonies, but they're also kind of middle ground in politics, aristocracy, farm size, industry. We kind of see these as the most American of the colonies because of diversity. Okay, lots of ethnical mix here in this particular region. First one we'll talk about specifically is New York. Uh, this is a Dutch founded colony, uh, not an English founded colony. Okay. They call this New Netherland at the beginning, and it's located along the Hudson River. And it's later going to be called, obviously, New York, with its capital was Amsterdam, which is going to become New York City. They made a decent profit in fur trades, but the colony was nothing compared to the Dutch East India Company located in Southeast Asia. In 1664, uh, New Amsterdam surrenders to a large English fleet. Uh, fleet without ever having a shot fired. So England takes over New York from the Dutch. Uh, so now England controls America from Maine all the way down to the Carolinas with no colonies in between from any other foreign country. More interesting uh, colonies, probably Pennsylvania. Uh, the fellow on the page we see here is William Penn. Uh, it's He's probably the most famous Quaker uh, the Pennsylvania colony is settled by Quakers, and they wanted to be left alone after persecution in England. So William Penn is given a huge land grant because the king owed his father a debt. Pennsylvania used accurate and successful advertising to many nations, and they recruited uh, farmers, masons, uh, shoemakers, carpenters, and other manual laborers to come to Pennsylvania. And these are the most truthful of the advertisements used to attract people to their particular colony. Now, Pennsylvania contains our first planned city. Okay, It was Philadelphia. The Quakers negotiated with and they bought a lot of land from the Indians in Pennsylvania and relationships between them were, you know, pretty good uh, early on. They had a representative assembly, which was elected by the landowners. There again, you see that uh, seeds of democracy. They instituted separation of church and state, another seed of democracy. And it should be known that the Quakers are very tolerant uh, of many faith. There's a rich mix of ethnic groups located in Pennsylvania as well. Then we come to New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey is a very simple colony. It was uh, granted to two proprietors by the Duke of York. Uh, many New Englanders come to New England, uh, or excuse me, come to New Jersey, basically for economic reasons to try to make some money. Uh, in 1702, East and West Jersey were combined into one colony uh, called New Jersey. One other colony that we didn't really discuss, Delaware, is uh, going to become part of our colonies uh, later on. It's not overly significant and never makes its way onto the AP exam. But I have implemented here the, the chart of the 13 original colonies, their year, their charter, when they were made royal, and what their status was in 1775. Hope you enjoyed uh, today's presentation. If you have any questions, uh, comment below. Don't forget to like and subscribe these videos. Uh, thanks a lot.